uh, it was pretty preconceived that I was going to go down one path because I was at Harvard and structural IO, um, ah. Ariel Pecos was, who was, turned out to be my main advisor. Right? Oh, like, okay. I didn't have a choice at Harvard, right? Yeah. Chris Nosco is a PhD economist, as well as Vice President, Head of Science and Analytics for Uber. He's my guest this week on The Mixtape with Scott, part of my ongoing series of talking to economists in tech. Chris did his PhD in economics at Harvard, focused on industrial organization, did a one-year stint at eBay postdoc, then went on to become an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. But he left. He's part of this more recent wave of PhD economists who left academia and went to the tech sector. Um, and first went to Amazon, which is part of a common part of that broader story of the growth of the labor market for PhD economists in tech. And then more recently uh, to Uber, where he's been for the last few years. In this interview, we talk about a lot of stuff, growing up in rural Oregon, uh, falling into programming, a love of his liberal arts education at the University of Chicago, uh, and as well as just a broad navigation of economics as a field, but also as a career, and his own just uh, personality uh, of being an intellectually curious person. This was a really delightful opportunity for me to learn more about Chris and get to know him a little better. I didn't know him beforehand, but I teach one of his papers uh, with uh, uh, Blake, Nosco and Tadalas, a 2015 article in Econometrica um, from that was born out of his time at eBay. Uh, so it was really nice to get to meet him and talk to him. But it was also neat to get a better idea of the broader trends in the market for PhD uh, PhD economists that's been happening in large mass really over the last 10 years or so in the tech industry. There was an earlier wave of more senior people, and he mentions this. Um, people like Hal Varian and Susan Athey that kind of pioneered and went out into tech. But really the more recent has been the hiring of younger, junior level PhD economists. And that that's a, getting to hear uh, Chris talk about that was really eye-opening. I think a lot of people are gonna find Chris's story though, really interesting, personally intriguing, may even see themselves or possible possibilities uh, of their own life in Chris's own personal story, both his excitement and his intellectual curiosity for economics, as well as a possible life of what he calls doing science in tech. Um, something that I don't think a lot of people think of as what an economist's job is in tech. Thank you again for coming and listening uh, to this podcast. I'm Scott Cunningham, your host. Well, this is a real pleasure to, um, uh, introduced this week's uh, in, uh, guest on the the podcast, uh, Chris Nosco. Uh, thanks so much for being here. For sure. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, before we get started, you could just say uh, your name. I said your name, but your name, your title, and uh, who who it is that writes you your 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 paychecks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My name is Chris Nosco. Um, I am a vice president of applied science at Uber now. Um, so I lead the science team that works on uh, most of Uber's core algorithms, both on the mobility side, uh, which is rideshare, as most people know it, and delivery, which is getting uh, you know food delivered to to your house. Okay, cool. All right, I can't wait to dive into this. Okay, well, so before we get into your career, um, where'd you grow up? I grew up in rural Oregon. Oh, small town about an hour west of Portland, as I like to say. Oh, cool. Hour west. Oh, so you're that is Portland pretty close to the water already? Uh, Portland's about an hour and a half to two hours. So I was uh, I was on the way to the coast, but not all the way to the coast. In oh, wow. So did your family do vacations on the water? Like, yeah, we would go. Yep. Yeah, we went to the to the ocean quite often. Yeah, it was very much in our wheelhouse for sure. Is it pretty cold up there in the when you get in the oceans that that high? It, it's it, cold you know, water, right? Where, yeah, I was going to say it depends on where you're coming from. Compared to Florida, it's really, really cold. It's really cold. Um, yeah, but you know, it's it, it, you still go in the water. It's it's not so bad once you get used to it. Yeah. Well, so what? So you? So what kind of? What were some of your favorite vacations that you had with your family as a kid? What's like 
what's a really memorable one that you still remember? Yeah, we did a lot of, you know, outdoor hiking, camping type stuff. Uh, so a lot, of the mem- my, a lot of my memorable uh, vacations with my family really evolved camping um, in some way, shape or form. That was a oh, big, okay. A big part of our lives, I would say. Just kind of in that area too? Or do you ever go anywhere else? My, mainly in Oregon and Washington. A pretty yeah. simple stuff for the yeah, most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what'd, your, what'd your mom and dad do for a living? Um, they both worked at the school that I grew up at. So um, my dad was an administrator, uh, just retired, and my mom was a school teacher. She taught middle school there at the school. Oh, okay. So they, they so so they were both school teachers. Yeah. In yeah. that in that smaller, it was a small town. Yeah, very small. Yep. Yep. Wow. Share it over again for those who uh, who know it or can look it up on Google. Yeah. So I bet you had a really nice childhood. That kind of small town childhood, just like doing whatever. Yeah, it had uh, definitely pros and it had cons or what seemed like cons to me at the time, but in retrospect, were actually quite nice. So I'll explain that. Pros, of course, was like you say, small town, everybody knew everybody else, community, things along those lines. Yeah. Cons, especially if you're, uh, you know, growing up is we were, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes to the movie theater. You know? Yeah, 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 right. Oh, so it was that small. It was that small yeah, of a town. Well, yeah, very, very much. So, mm-hmm. you know, the sorts of conveniences that you get used to in yeah. a lot of parts of the U.S. we just didn't really have. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, again, like in retrospect, it's nice to have that rural trees, all that kind of stuff. It's beautiful. I love visiting back then. But yeah. as a kid, all you want to do is go to McDonald's, man. And McDonald's right. was not that easy. You're like, go. all right, get in the car. We're going to be gone for an hour. Go ahead and yeah. use the bathroom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's right uh so so is so so um so did you graduate from high school in that town yep i did yeah well so what was the high school like it was a small it was i guess it was smaller yeah i actually went to a private school outside of sheridan a very small school my graduating class had 15 people in it so extremely mm. very tiny so very very much um you know just small individualized attention things along those lines okay what were your interests what were your kind of schooling interests and stuff computers i was really really interested in computers um all the way through high school i did a lot of programming i played a lot of sports as well so between computers and sports those were my two things man I spent most of my time doing those two things well, what were you doing on the computer you were doing like website design or something else yeah, I learned I learned to program Pascal Basic C back in those days, mm. uh, and just was really engaged. To, you know, that was a that was very much a time of tinkering with things. Like, you know, learned to build my own computers, things along those lines. I, a lot of I think a lot of nerdy type people at that age go through that kind of phase and, and yeah. through really hardcore. Yeah. yeah, and then I went through and um, you know started web design as well um, along those lines. But I'm a terrible graphic designer. Right. So at the end of the day, that was those were back in the days when you were doing the whole thing on your yeah. own and you like very quickly that if you're not good at graphic design your web yeah that's not- right they were really bundled it's like right when the the that kind of age of programming it was like i always felt that too it's like well yeah this is great but i don't know i don't know what how to make anything pretty exactly exactly yeah. so i think over time it's of course web web development and, and just development in general it's like you know bifurcated in many ways so you can be yeah. hardcore nerd or you can be graphic designer but right back then everything was still kind of like as you say bundled together a little well, bit so what kind of stuff were you making you were making websites or blogs or what were you doing yeah i mean um so actually they just kind of actually furthers my uh development of, like career a little bit actually after i graduated from high school i didn't go directly to college i was actually working doing web development um, and moved up to Seattle for a year um, oh, wow. after, under, after high school and before before undergrad. And so then I was doing like web development type stuff. And that's actually part of when I really got into like some of the more hardcore type stuff. This mm. is like, I mean, I'm hardcore-ish, right? Like this is more like Microsoft active server pages and like, you know, some of the C infrastructure that went into it, things along those lines. So, how'd you get that gig? What were you, how'd, how'd you even, so you like, were, you were a high school graduate, but that was like a real job. Yeah, yeah, I was working 40, 40 hours a week, real, real, uh, you know, full time job, things along those lines. And so this was in, I mean, this is in the late 90s. And if you if you rewind to the late 90s, you'll remember that there was just like this huge yeah. need for programmers, right? Right, and, right. And actually, it's really interesting because programming is one of those things where it's really like a great equalizer in some ways because you can demonstrate, right? You know, like it's not one of those things where it's just about like, oh, what education do you have, et cetera. It's like, yeah, you get up to the board and you write some fucking code. So I don't know if I can drop the F-bomb in this, but like- I can drop that phone here. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, or like you, they, they ask for like samples of your work, things along those lines. So it's very yeah. merit, meritocratic in that sense. And, right. and like 
that that was a great time to be doing this sort of stuff. And then of course the dot com boom hit all that kind of stuff and yeah. you know things moved in a different direction. But yeah, the late nineties were in some ways, I think a, a golden era in many ways, but um, especially for people that had programming skills and not a lot of like formal education. Yeah, yeah. So you decide not to stay. That was it. You you decided then you're like I'm ready to go to college. Yeah, one of the best, one of the best and most consequential things for me in life was realizing that early on that it's really important to go to college, or it was really important for me to go to college, right? Yeah. Um, because I had always had this vision, I want to go to college, why spend four years, et cetera. Um, but then once you get into the day-to-day and you're able to look at people ahead of you and what they were doing, et cetera, yeah. that's how I felt about it. I, I quickly realized I was like, this just isn't, there's got to be more to it than this. And that kind of pushes you, or at least definitely pushed me to to college. Um, so how long were you up there doing that? Three years. Three years. You were up there three years. Total three years between when I graduated from undergrad. Sorry, when I graduated from high school and when I started in undergrad. So yeah, you were there was a three year gap of, between yep. high school and college. Exactly right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. when you decided to go to college, where'd you what what were you like? What was your your you probably went with like some real fortitude? Like I I have a plan. Is that right? Yeah, I applied to one and only one school, which was the University of Chicago, and I applied. Uh, you know, early decision. I got an early decision and, you know, just went with it. So I I, I really had a pretty clear conception uh, of what I wanted to do. Of course, uh, you know, it turns out that that was just all hubris. And of course, yeah. I should have applied to many more schools. And right. if I had given myself more of a latitude to think of, maybe I would have applied to different types of schools, things like that. I didn't have any knowledge of that at all. Yeah. And so I was really attracted to a lot about um, what the UFC offered. And so I just went with it. It was great. It turned out to be a great decision for me. But you know, of course, very narrow in, in retrospect. I wouldn't. Well, so, it. what were you think? What did you even know about Chicago as a as a young person like that? Two things. Um, one was I love the idea of a liberal arts education in yeah. Chicago, right? Like sort of this strong uh, core curriculum and this idea of the great books, things along those lines. It was very attractive mm. to me at the time. And the second thing, which we'll again hopefully end up spending a lot of time talking about, was. The economics program and um you know i had always been interested in economics um you know you sort of dabbled around in some sense i mm-hmm. you know, like didn't really know what an economist did i mean who understands what an economist does when yeah. you're like high school right it's right. kind of a weird unknown thing yeah um i just love the idea of what i knew about economics mm-hmm. and so the combination of obviously the history that chicago has with econ and mm-hmm. the combination of the liberal arts education um kind of pushed me in that direction and then frankly i just went and visited and i loved it fell in love it wait so so when did you first start when did you start first start having any interaction with economics before i even ask about chicago what 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 about was it in high school or what was it yeah it was in high school um around some of this idea of like classical liberal yeah the fee right which also also kind of pushed me into like chicago as well right you know like sort yeah. of like the Milton Friedman Hayek type stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think is a you know, of course, an infatuation of many, many high school kids, right? Yeah, and it was a little bit for me as well, along you know the cleanliness of free markets, things right. along those lines, right? Um, yeah. and then while I, while I was working, I took a couple of community college classes on, on economics and kind of learned much more about the nitty gritty of like supply demand curves and shifting demand curves and moving along demand curves, kind of mm-hmm. everything you learn in like you know, micro 101. And um, I just really like that. Um, so those are the two areas that I had kind of already started to think a little bit about. Yeah. Of course, then you get to college and grad school and you realize, well, it's totally different than that. But at the end of the day, that excitement around economics really, um, I think, built. Um, with yeah, it's, it always is also kind of has always felt like Chicago had Chicago and that kind of classical liberal tradition in general has more inroads in the tech industry for some reason. I don't know if I've, if I'm even viewing that right, but I would think even back then it seemed like, is that, is that accurate? I mean, I don't, I don't have like a, like I've never done like a professional survey or anything along those lines. Um, But I think that's probably true that there's very much a theme that carries through both of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any great theories of pulling those. But you would have like, but but you're up there programming and, and being a part of that community, you were, you were only having that in, like kind of reinforced a little bit around you, that interest in Chicago. That's right. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. I mean, both, both economics, at least in the classical liberal sense 
and programming have a very, to me, they have a very like clean view on things, right? Like if only you could figure out right. what the algorithm is and break it into like subcomponents in a very neat and clean way. Yeah. And so it kind of appeals, I think both of those things probably appeal to a certain like logical structure in, in, right. in certain people's brains. And so they end up um, kind of pulling together. Well, you know? so what happens at Chicago? Tell me what, what's, uh, what, what did you think your first year was going to be like and what was it like? Um, I loved it. My first year was my first and my second years were probably my favorites, um, mainly for reasons that we were just talking about, which is it exposed me to a whole new set of things, you know, around the great books that I, you know, just were like kind of blew my mind and kind of like mm. changed my whole perspective on life in many ways. Right. Wow. You know, I, I really had nothing to do with economics at that time. I was taking econ classes and there was sort of like a separate thread that we could talk about, about my transition there. But actually my econ classes were definitely not the most exciting part of my, my first and second years of college. I mean, it's sort of like micro econ at U Chicago is about doing a lot of calculus, right? It's about taking a lot of derivatives and like, that's not, you, you kind of the content and the deep economics yeah. didn't really come out until much later, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're eating your vegetables um, in that sense for right. first and second year and uh, micro and, and then macro. Mm -hmm. um, but the the world of ideas that came from, you know, a lot of the sort of stuff we were reading around political philosophy and mm. you know, going all the way back to like, you know, just, just the, you know, Hume and people like that were just really influential. Influential. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, what did you do? You get a major in economics, or do you get like this kind of broader, uh, great books kind of major? Oh, your first two years are pretty much all just uh, liberal arts type stuff. Mm -hmm. You like of your core curriculum majors, and then your third and fourth year end up being pretty much all your major, right? So, oh. yes, the answer is you do. I, I ended up with a major in economics. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, the, you just tilt more towards kind of some of the great book stuff. Yeah. Well, years. so which professors as an undergrad at Chicago really made an impression on you? I didn't, you know, I didn't really have a ton of like those inspirational professors that I can speak to, you know, mm. um, I never had that moment with a professor to be really honest. I was really engaged with the material, but yeah, I think material more than anything spoke for itself rather than like some professor that I really like. Wait, so is that like you're there as an undergrad before Levitt wrote Freakonomics? Oh, way before, yeah, this is way before. Way before. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe not way before. This is, I was an undergrad from 1999 to 2003. I think Freakonomics. Oh yeah, because I think that's like more mid, right? Like 2005 or six or something? Yeah. Yeah, oh. like you know, Jim, Jim Heckman had just won the Nobel Prize. And so oh, was, yeah. you know, on campus for Jim Heckman, right? You know, things along those lines. Mm. So that was kind of where we were at as a, I guess, as the Chicago was at as an economics department was much more than the Heckman stuff pre-Levitt -Le, pre kind mm. of became really popular with economics. Well, what did you think about Becker's stuff when you were an undergrad? You know, because that's like, it's funny, like Becker's not really the celebrity amongst the classical, lib like he's he's not the, he's not the gateway drug, you know, the way that classical liberalism is for people that get into econ. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not always. He was for me, but not for everybody. Oh, Becker was for you. I'm curious. Yeah. I read his, I read his Nobel prize speech. I was a, I was a kind of a more of a liberal arts, but I was a English major and, um, yeah. and I uh, had a, got a job doing market research, uh, qualitative research and ended up trying to teach myself a bunch of qualitative methodology so that kind of takes you into like reading sociology and stuff. But oh, yeah. I ended up at the John M. Olin working paper series at Chicago for some reason and was just reading kind of, you know, you know, you know, like when you're on the internet, you're just like following yeah. these weird trails. And so yeah. I was deep in that stuff and I already, but I was really into economics too for the classical liberal stuff. I just, and I, you know, if you're into economics for the classical liberal stuff, then you'll read a lot of the Chicago people but they're like, in some ways, not nearly as classical liberal because they're like robust mainstream economics. You know, it's like so much, you know, even though it's got that long history, it's not like George Mason or the Austrian or something, right, right, you know? Right, yeah. And so, um, so I kind of quit noticing it that I was like, like, I didn't notice where I was as much. And then I ended up reading Becker's Nobel Prize speech after reading a bunch of Law and Econ. And I just was like, I'll never, I just remember thinking, well, I don't think I'll ever be happy if I'm not an economist. So well, there you go. I mean, that's inspiring right there. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty great. It was yeah. pretty great. I mean, I, 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 
Yeah, we, you and I actually have really similar interests. I mean, um, and I do want to get into it, but like, so, so then you graduate and you, do you immediately say, I want to become an economist? No, at the time I was, was still trying to figure out myself a little bit and what I wanted to do. Um, you know, and I, I actually hadn't, and this is maybe a lesson for people that are listening or interested in econ grad school, I actually hadn't done some of or a lot of the stuff that you're quote unquote supposed to do to get into a good econ program when I was an undergrad, right? You know, like real analysis, things along the hardcore math. I didn't do that, right? Yeah. Um, and so in some ways, you know, really I wasn't quite uh, qualified to go to like a, a really good econ PhD program. So what, what I ended up doing was um, I was also very interested in the idea of potentially becoming a lawyer, which yep. would have been a terrible mistake. So yep. I'm glad that I was able to be you know, like, I did but, that too. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, that's you right. The idea or you became a lawyer. I, yeah. Some guy told me, he said, you, you'd probably like being a, a, a law student more than a lawyer. And I was like, exactly. I don't know exactly what that means, but I kind of know exactly what that means. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but it sounds bad. Right? <laughs> it sounds like three years that I would like, and then stuff followed that I wouldn't like. Yeah, keep going. Sorry. So I took a I took a job at an economics consulting company where I felt like I could learn a little bit more about like what it was like to do economics in the real world as well as get exposure to to you know the legal world and to lawyers, which yeah. is when I learned that I really wouldn't want to be a lawyer, right? Because I could <laughs> like you see a lot of lawyers and you're like, hey, there's some people doing this cool economic stuff. And then there are some people that really hate their lives. And <laughs> I know which of the two of those camps that I work <laughs> It's Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, Where'd you end up going doing the consulting? Was it like Lexicon or something like that? Uh, it was uh, Nira. I did. I worked at Nira. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Was just Nira, yeah. Um, so after a year of doing that, I was kind of like, look, I want to do this econ thing. I know I'm not, I, I'm just not ready for that. So I took a job as a research assistant for a Harvard professor, David Labson. Um, oh. So, he, so um, he had this, uh, David is great. I, I love David. David is very inspiring as an economist and, and was a wonderful person to work for. So he had a, a little crew of people working at the National Bureau of Econ Economic Research, NBER, right, um, in Cambridge. Oh, so Cambridge. this is prior to going to Harvard. You like, you get a yeah, gig yeah, as an yeah. RA at the NBER for Labson. What year is this? 2004 2005 okay okay yeah so um you know this is a it's a wonderful wonderful way um to expose yourself to what it's like to do lean econ research is to be a, re a research assistant for a professor and so that was a, a, a great experience for me um you know and it, of course the deal was you know like you do really good work and david um you know writes a really good recommendation letter for you and that's sort of like explicitly why why you're in it and he knows that and everybody knows it and mm -hmm. um, so that that was my path to harvard actually was not through the normal channel of like real analysis like things along those lines it was um working as a research assistant and um kind of um building david's trust over that year and then um, he helped me get into harvard so. but you know that's weird that's the new model also is the pre-doc ra position yeah and that's yeah. that's so probably that's like an early version of it. Yeah, exactly. It was very less formalized, right. as, formalized as it is now. Mm. Um, but yeah, definitely wasn't wasn't early. Um, what do you think made him notice you to give you that opportunity? You mean yeah. why did he hire me in the first place? Yeah, was it like your coding experience or something? Like, that probably that probably helped. You know, they they actually said they they um. You know, they had a set of rigorous, inter rigorous interviews where they kind of grilled me over the course of. A, there's a professor there named uh, James Troy as well, who's now at Yale, who also was working with oh, yeah. a group of those people together. Bridget uh, Majorin as well. So like three of them, and they all kind of grilled me and like, you know. But I again, I was also coming from Chicago. Like I had good grades at Chicago. I had kind of proven myself through that. So um, through the, I think the combination of the Chicago, um, you know, transcript plus doing well in yeah. those interviews. Plus the coding skills, probably. Yeah, 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 right, right. So, and also, like, let's be honest, I was not making very much money. So, you know, at the end of the yeah. day, like, <laughs> their ability to be super choosy is restricted by you know the pool of applicants that are willing to work for <laughs> not as much money in exchange, right. for, like, you know, future value and things along. Yeah, 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 preference yeah. signaling and stuff like that, right? Exactly right. Uh, right. I mean, so, so that's interesting. So, so then with Labson something starts to make you think 
well, so you, you were like, I don't want to do the law thing and you're doing this RA thing with Labeson. And so at some point you start thinking, I actually might want to do an economics PhD. Yeah. Yeah. By the time I was a few months into that job, I was pretty convinced I wanted to do an econ PhD okay. for sure. And a big part of that was, you know, that's when I really got, um, you know, that's when I first really got exposed to what it was like to actually do economic research, you know, because yeah. we would sit in these weekly meetings with David and, and James and, and Bridget, and we would like bounce ideas off of each other. And then mm -hmm. we, as the RAs would go and run a bunch of regressions and come back next week and show a bunch of, you know, regression results. And then we would, you know, decompose those regression results and ask questions about them. And like, you know, then the conversation would evolve. Um, so mm. it was very real um, research and um, I loved it. Like the intellectual curiosity, the ability to then take a question that you don't know the answer to and go look at a bunch of data and yeah. like start to, you know, actually learn how to, you know, use regression and econometrics to answer some of these questions, things along those lines. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, you, you know, that you think a lot about in terms of like causal inference and sources of endogeneity, things along those lines, right? So um, it was sort of, for me, the full package of econ research, and I really liked it. And, you know, mm. so that sold me on on the idea of doing an econ PhD. Mm. For sure. mm. Yeah. Mm. It's funny. I mean, you know, it's, it's weird the way that, that liberal arts background, I, I, I see so much of econ. I see, you know, it's funny, like economics and the liberal arts background and the coding and, and that creativity, they, they, they really go so well together, but it's like, unless you're doing it, you don't know they go well together. Cause like from a, <laughs> from a distance, it's not really as visible yeah. to a, an observer that, that that's what life is kind of like a little bit. I think a big part of it for me is just this idea of intellectual curiosity. Yeah. You know, being really interested and engaged. Um, and I, I think that that's been a thread for me through my whole life, you know, mm. around all that sort of stuff. And so, in, you know, intellectual curiosity drew me to, you know, liberal arts education, intellectual curiosity drew me to doing econ research. Mm. Um, and, and to a certain extent, the, the programming and the tech stuff, because it's just, intellectually really interesting once you get into the guts of like the tech stuff and how it works right kind of programming things along those lines so to me there was a common thread um, among those yeah. things um but i i don't know if that's unique to me or there's actually other people who feel very similarly well so who did you end up working with at harvard was it Leibson? Yeah. no so um i ended up i still stayed in touch with with Leibson, but you know david was very much into the behavioral yeah world right that's his thing um that wasn't so much where i wanted to go with my career. did you think that was going to be what you were interested in i didn't know yeah. i didn't know. um but what became very clearly apparent to me is i wasn't ready for any of the behavioral stuff mm. because I, I think it's really important to kind of get your grounding in like you know economic theory and here's how you think about economic theory before you then start layering in this other stuff on yeah top of it. And i think that's what david has done really well right like that's why that i think that's what you know what has set david apart is his ability to like live in both of these worlds right i think yeah so i knew that once i was working for david i was like you know this is really interesting this is great stuff but i need to i need to go back and really fill in the gaps here before yeah. we even engage in that so i started grad school and i actually really interested in two different topics very different topics one was sort of political economics and mm. kind of, so marty feldstein was at harvard at the time um and you know so he was pretty big in you know public economics and things along those lines um and then the other was industrial organization which um, do you want me to explain for people out there what that is i don't yeah know. that'd be great mm -hmm. yeah so industrial organization is a, a subfield of economics that thinks about how markets are organized and how firms interact within those markets. So a lot of things around monopoly and competition, um, you know, kind of like how do firms uh, compete with each other and think, you know, big firms, small firms, what's the, what, what do we, how do we think about firm size and innovation, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, does that sound accurate to you? you want to feel yeah. Like you know yeah. That does sound accurate to me. Yeah. Uh, you, but you sort of move, I, I mean, you know, in some ways you, you really move kind of rapidly to that. I guess going to Harvard, you're going to move to the edge of IO, but like even in your, your research, you know, this focus on platforms and the yep. two-sided matching it, it's, were you already doing that at Harvard? 
I was by the time I was working on like say my dissertation and I like third, fourth, fifth years, right? So I was already kind of I had I had pretty firmly moved in that direction by that point. So so yeah, like so were you in your so in your what was your dissertation on for I? Yeah, my dissertation was about uh, actually the CPU market, so Intel and AMD, oh. and how they how they compete with each other and sort of um, what's the relationship between. Um, the product lines that they offered and sort of innovation in the market overall, right? And oh. so I was really pretty into tech even at that point when it came right. to our research, right? Did um, you notice that you were going to be, was that something tech was just always in your head? Yeah. Because even going back to that time and after college. Exactly. Yeah. And so sort of always, tech has always been a part of how I thought about the world. And like, if you right. give me, if you give me, three hours on the internet, I might spend two hours reading random tech blogs and things right. like that. Um, right, right, you know, right. more, so, more so then than now, now that I spend most of my time thinking about tech stuff on a daily mm -hmm. day, especially back then. So, mm -hmm. you know, as I found myself in grad school and you really have to be, I mean, as you know, wow, like you have to be really, really, you have to be really fucking motivated by your research, right? Because, yeah. you know, especially as a grad student, when you're just dropped yeah, you know, well, this is the way it worked at Harvard. I think right. it still does. In your third year, it's just like, okay, congratulations, go write a dissertation. You right. know, and um, so you have to be really engaged and really interested in the topic. And um, so I found myself gravitating to the things that were interesting to me, and, and that turned out to be tech. Um, mm. a lot of tech mm -hmm. I will say, I also think that there's another element of this, which is, I mean, I would love to talk about this, which is. You know, what was fascinating for me about going through grad school is all of these, like we were talking about classical liberal philosophy earlier and like perfect competition. And um, I always sort of the opposite of that, right? Like IO says, uh, industrial organization says, perfect competition doesn't apply most of the time. Right. So how does the world actually work? How do markets actually function? And to me, that was very appealing because it was much more with, consistent with my idea of how most markets actually function and certainly more consistent with most of the markets that I was interested in, right? Mm. You, know, um, you know, not most markets are not organized in a way like, you know, what, what's the classic example of wheat, right? Wheat number, number two wheat, right? For perfect competition, right? And that's just not the world that we engage with for the right. most part. We go to the supermarket, you know, the, these are these are firms that are, much they're large firms they're conglomerates they're engaging with each other in ways that are that are not perfectly competitive and so yeah. i was drawn to that because to me it described the world mm. in a better and um, more palette more more realistic way right mm. um and so i wanted to say that like it's sort of you start to go down this path and grad for me i went down this path of, in grad school and especially with studying io where you start to say well yeah but what are the assumptions that underlie like classical liberal theory, right? And then you start asking yourself more and more questions and then you kind of end up in a very, for me, I ended up in a very different place, which is you have to recognize that there are real sort of challenges to markets functioning appropriately or effectively, I should say, not appropriately, right. effectively. And right. so then you then it gets really interesting because you start asking the questions of like, under what circumstances do markets, uh, you know, work well and, and when do they not? And that mm. to me is a really, really interesting topic area. So I got really into that. Um, and, um, kind of never have looked back to be really honest. That's been yeah. Run thread through things. The, did you, when you were starting to think about like moving away from perfect competition, but thinking purely in terms of like the tech application, was there certain kinds of ways that tech is imperfect? That's not as obvious to somebody that doesn't like know it really well. Well, I, you know what, it, the thing that is, was most interesting, I don't know if this is going to exactly answer your question or or not, but I think is kind of where a lot of the action is, is sort of like the dynamics of these industries, right? Uh -huh. So I'll give you an example, like take the market I was studying for my dissertation, which is CPUs, which is, you know, has two firms, Intel and AMD, right? You know, mm. for, you know, the type of market that I was looking at, that, that's it. That's the whole market there is two firms, right? Um, and so on the one hand, like first order, it's very hard to say like, this is a super competitive market, right? Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you know, a lot of the data kind of shows you that it is functioning relatively well as a pretty interesting, perfectly, I mean, these firms are competing hard with each other, right? So mm -hmm. then you start asking yourself why and, you know, what's going on. Um, and then you start layering in 
So it's not about static competition. It's about like the long run dynamics of competition between the two firms. And you start talking about things like innovation. How does a firm like Intel actually innovate or a firm like AMD actually innovate? And how do they recoup their investment in these large, you know, like innovation activities that they do, right? And to me, then, so I guess I'm not really answering your question, but I'm mm. changing the question a little yeah. bit to say, like, you know, it, it's not, it, it's that the the nature of imperfect competition is really mm. super interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, because of, because it's not just static, it's also dynamic. And then it, it's right. not just about like, how big is the firm? It's like, you know, how substitutable are the products, right? Things along those lines. And then, and then, and then you start having to put together these models um, that have the appropriate level of complexity for the problem space that you're working in. And that's the art, I think, of working in, in IO is put, and, and actually in tech, I would say, is how do you put together a, a model that appropriately captures the features you want to capture, but is not so complicated that you can no longer make any sense out of it or actually... Yeah it in any way shape or form you know? well so do you, i mean is there like was there like a, a a body of models that you found to be like really the most useful in graduate yeah, well, I mean, I was, about this? yeah i mean i was pretty i was i was pretty uh it was pretty preconceived that i was going to go down one path because i was at harvard and structural io um ah. Ariel Pecos was who was turned out to be my main advisor. Right? Oh, like, okay. I didn't have a choice at Harvard, right? Yeah, like, yeah. If you were gonna be, if you were gonna be an IO, you were gonna be a structural IO uh -huh. guy, right? Or woman. and and that's you know, but that I loved, right? Like structural IO, I think is a wonderful way of organizing thoughts and forcing clarity of thought on the problem that you're studying, right? Because you have to write it all down with math, right? You know, you can't get away with sloppy logic um you know you you're you're literally writing down your mathematical model of how you think firms are behaving and you have to make very real trade-offs around how you put in complexity okay so, so, so let's say i took an io economist from like the 80s yeah. and i like and you, you you guys meet he's like been in ice or whatever like captain america yeah. and then he, and like he thaws him out and he and he's and you're like he meets you and he's like, what structural IO, what, what, what would he, how would you explain to him that it in a way that he would understand that it, what's similar and different about it? Uh, from like the, you know, like from anything that's like in the past of like, yeah, a, like a, on that Google continuum. Oh yeah. Like IO, right. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think the biggest difference comes with the idea that you're actually going to try and econometrically estimate the models that you're writing down, right? So let me explain why that's so important because you you have to work through your model to get something that you can actually estimate. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look back at the you know like sort of '80s style IO, you know, again like the John Turrell's famous textbook, which we all kind of use, right? Like there was no sense in which you know there was an effort to take those models and literally estimate the the, the primitives of the model, right? Like, right. you know, it was all kind of, you know, like, hey, let's write down, you know, an applied theory model of the world and then let's test its implications, right? Which is a very different style of research or of an approach to the problem relative to the structural IO one that says, hey, let's actually write down the, the theoretical model and then try and estimate the actual parameters of the model in a way that's interpretable within the theoretical frame. I bet that right? was really exciting. It is. It's a very, very fun, exciting field, structural I.O. It, it's um, also very technically complex because you're trying to estimate these pretty crazy models to a certain extent, um, yeah. going in that direction as well. And you end up learning a lot about econometrics. I'd never thought I would be, I never thought I would go deep on econometrics, but it kind of, I, 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 I'm not an econometrician by any stretch, but like you end up down this path of needing to, to start to go in that direction. I love that. What are the skills? What are the latent skills that, you know, a, makes a person... Well, what did you, what were the skills you didn't know that you had that in fact were really well rewarded by that? Programming. I mean, it's going to come back the to coding the stuff? coding stuff. I mean, you, the, the coding stuff, you had to be pretty, you had to be pretty good coder to be able Cause to you're work. picking up MATLAB. Is that what you're yeah, working MATLAB with? at the time, at the time it was all MATLAB. I think most places have moved to uh, R and Python at this point, but yeah, back oh. then it was MATLAB. So, um, so yeah, I was I learned MATLAB was pretty hardcore into MATLAB. MATLAB has these like C interfaces that become really interesting if you're trying mm. to do hardcore stuff. So I didn't know that I would need those skills, but 
they sure came in handy when you're working on some of these problems. So then you graduate and you go to, you go back to Chicago as a faculty member. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, I actually um, took a, a one year postdoc, although we didn't call it that at eBay from 2011 to 2012. Oh. Um, I, when I applied for jobs, I was kind of like, is that when you met Steve to Dallas? Yeah. Yeah. Steve and I worked in Blake. Okay. I know I, that you're a Conometrica. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We worked on that paper um, uh, that, that year I was at, at eBay. Uh -huh. So, so actually, so what happened was I applied broadly to a bunch of different places as you want to do, right. When you're on the job market, you'd be pretty risk averse things along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and again, like I was always interested in tech and you, you remember this was 2011. There were not a lot of tech economists at that point. There were very, yeah. very few tech economists. So this is I the saw, beginning, right? Yeah. It's, it's like, really is that, is that the case? I've been trying to figure it out. Like I know Varian goes earl much earlier, but it seems like there's a second wave. Is that right? I think or like a, or the, the modern wave starts like 2010. I think the, the, if you, if you looked at like just a graph of the number of economists, I think 2011 is when it starts to pick up. Right. Okay. There were people in the, you know, there were economists in the tech industry, you know, Yahoo research labs had a, had a pretty reasonable sized group. And, and, you know, like, I think there were people like, you know, Randall Lewis and Justin Rao, who went, you know, a few years, that was like 2007, 2008, maybe 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a few folks that had really, I think, been the pioneers, especially, you know, because there were Hal and, um, you know, Susan, but Hal, like, Hal came very late in his career. I think what what's different about this next set of wave of economists is, is people really coming after their PhD and moving right. into the tech. Right. right. And the actual shift that we started to see starting in 2009, 2010, and then picking up steam in 2011, right, mm. was, you know, the the actual path that takes a PhD economist into one of these tech firms. That didn't exist, I think, before 2008, 2009. Right? Why do you think it changed? Um, that's, I, I mean, I don't have the relevant context because I don't know what these firms were like in 2005, 2006. 2006. Well, who started this postdoc at eBay? Yeah, there was a uh, a guy named Neil Sanderson who led the eBay research labs. Oh. And he just one day thought to himself, well, I don't know about one day, but he was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have an economist around or a couple economists around? And so, you know, he talked to a um, few of the, who, who was involved then. This was like, um, Laurent Inev was at Stanford and some of you, he kind of started talking to these Stanford folks, of course, because that's the natural connection. Right. Um, John, and then Laurent and John um, were, were working at Stanford and he kind of like pulled them into the orbit and they said, okay, well, if you want to hire an economist, put in, uh, an ad on the Joe, right? right. And which is what, you know, the job offer openings for economists. So, you know, we just went through that path and I don't think Neil, frankly, I, I think Neil is awesome. I, I don't think he had any idea what he was doing at the time, right? But he was mm -hmm. being advised by Laurent and John. So I think it was just a kernel of an interesting idea from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, now, to be really clear, eBay Research Labs, which is where I've spent that year, um, you know, ended up imploding three or four years later, right? So these what research labs, well, I just in general, these research labs, um, and you know, the Yahoo Research Lab was the same way, right? Like the tech firms, it's very hard for a tech firm to support a research right. lab, right? It's just yeah. expensive and right. the connection between output. So it hasn't really been a workable model. But I think what you were seeing um, in the early days is you saw a few of these companies experimenting with the idea of a research labs. And then what happens is people go and they do this stuff and they end up being pretty good at it, right? You know, like yeah. the research labs per se, but at working with the companies and helping the companies, of which we could spend a whole half an hour, an hour talking about, you know, what makes someone good at that or not. But I, you yeah. know, I think someone like Justin Rao, who I have a ton of respect for, I just think he was really good at that. He was in a research labs, but he was also really good at working with people. And then things start to build on top of it. Well, there's human capital in that, right? I mean, yeah. like you're, you like, you like, why would you and then you go back to academia it's not really portable necessarily right, right. it's like it's like kind of it's like it's not firm specific human capital it's almost like sector specific yeah yeah that's right yeah and and a lot of those skills are i mean some of those are like you know actually how do i you know work with big data things along those lines which is not right. what you're trying to do in grad school maybe more so now than it used to be but you know that was not something we were doing in grad school it's like you know uh, big data type stuff. Yeah. But that is also the, I, I like how you put that, the sector specific human capital around 
how do I talk to somebody who's a project manager, but not an economist? Right. And then they tell you, you're an idiot. How do you respond to that? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to learn that. Um, and so I think what, what I, this, the narrative that I would tell is that people started moving into this space and building that human capital. And then it was sort of an adjacent thing to move from a research lab into like actually working in tech in, a, in an actual career. You know, it actually reminds me more almost in some way of development economics, because like in development, it seems like it's all about building alliances and working with these different stakeholders and like, right. you know, talking to these people that are going to do this and then moving over here. It's like yeah. much more like many social relationships and like, successful being successful at completing it and it yeah. is, it is it seems like there's almost like i mean I, you know it seems like tech actually it's like rewards non-cognitive skill like like social skills almost yeah i don't think i think i mean i hope that's not a shock to anybody that in order to succeed in the corporate world you i mean i guess it's not but it's like you know you don't really think economists don't have that reputation of yeah. like oh my my skill at like getting along is really gonna you know like e that economists don't usually have the, the reputation of having a, a skill of getting along yeah and to be really fair um you know i think the tech umbrella of economists at this point is mm -hmm. pretty broad and mm -hmm. so you can be hardcore nor nerd in your back corner not talking to anybody and there's probably a niche for you in tech mm -hmm. but it's not the it's not the path that we were working on back in 2011 2011 mm. Well, when I think we really just had to, econ had to be established. In order to establish it, you had to be uh, able to, you know, work with stakeholders and show value to those stakeholders. Yeah, right? so, yeah. You know, Gosh, I mean, did you want to, did you kind of wonder to yourself, wait a second, I'm about to go to Chicago, but it's kind of, I'm leaving something. Totally, 100%. That's a big part of it. I loved my year at eBay. It was wonderful. Um, you know, it was fun. It was fast paced. I learned a ton. Mm. I thought- it was fun to work with people. I love different perspectives. Um, you know, it was just a totally different thing than I had ever really been exposed to. Um, and so when I went back to Chicago, you know, it was a very jarring experience for me to go from, uh, you know, a job that was like super engaged and super, you know, I was meeting with people every day, talking to them, bouncing ideas off of each other to, you know, the academic world, which... Right. You know, um, it's just a very different, just a very different environment. And so mm -hmm. it was like, you know, I remember showing up to Booth and like having my office and it was the summer, it was like August or something along those lines. I walked in my office and like, there was a, you know, it was a, a printer and a, and, a, and a box of paper. And that was the only thing that was there, right? And there was no one around because it was August, of course. Yeah. There was no one in the whole building, you know? Right. Um, so I was leaving, I was leaving an environment that was really engaging. You know, uh, of course, I, I also liked my experience at Booth, but it became very clear to me when I was at Booth and doing the assistant professor thing that from a just life satisfaction perspective, like I was going to be much happier in tech than I was mm. in the academic. So wait, so where, what's been your path in tech? Because like, I know, so you were at eBay, do, you were at eBay, yeah. you, you leave Booth, where, where where have you gone? So then I was at, was at Booth for a few years um, and decided um, with, you know, my, my now wife, Erin, who was in Chicago, um, that we wanted to move to the, but another thing I would love to like, yeah. just say, um, uh -huh. just in terms of like, as we're having this conversation that I learned is that, you know, somehow economists convince themselves that location does not matter and you should take the best job you possibly can. Right. I've learned for myself, location is really fucking important, right? <laughs> yeah, like, sure. Yeah. It's really different to live in, you know, like, you know, Chicago relative to the West coast. And for uh -huh. me, I kind of had learned uh, again with, you know, I heard the winters are really nice though in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> is that yeah. not right? Said, is I hear the wrong, is that a rumor? Is that winter, not correct? Boston winters. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of fun, you know? So, um, yeah. So I, I think one, there were two, there were two. There was a lot that, of amenities that, that yeah. you were, you, you had had, you had experienced. That yeah, even. Exactly. Yeah, it, I was in California. I love California. I was in you know, Washington and Seattle yeah. places that I, yeah, that I knew as well. So I actually, my wife and I kind of, I just kind of like rethought about what I wanted out of my life when mm. I was like, kind of like recognizing that I don't, I don't love this, right? Like I'm not waking up like really super jazzed. I liked my research, but I then had had this experience at eBay that kind of showed me that there was something else out there in a deep way. 
and that made me kind of push me over. But Chris, you know, like when you would have done this, when you have, when you would have switched out, see, I, I feel like right now students can look at tech and they can be like, well, there's this whole continuum now of like kind of the, the junior level to a really high senior level. And it's like in your brain, it's molded that there's like a big distribution of compensation. There's like all these different ways to sort. But what did it seem like to you then? Because you wouldn't have had as much mass in the it, distribution, right? Yeah. So of role models or what to what what might be a career. Yeah, it was um what wasn't quite as drastic as you're making it sound. And I'll okay. You. But it because this was 2014, 2015. By that time, like I said, you know, things had started picking up a little bit. And in particular, to give away the story at Amazon, things had been so Pat Byer, he had been the chief economist at Amazon. I, I knew Pat um, from the academic circles. Um, and then uh, someone who's become a good friend of mine, Phil Leslie, also who was at Stanford, had gone to Amazon at that point as well. So there mm -hmm. was a few folks there that I trusted that I could talk to around what it was like to be at Amazon at the time. Yeah. Um, and you're right that there wasn't this continuum on what existed at Amazon at the time was a few very senior people, which at that point I believe was just Pat and Phil, um, and then a bunch of junior people that they had hired, right? And so what I was doing was kind of slotting in between and there was risk yeah. associated with that, right? There was, it was not that common for someone to move at that point in their career. Um, and so there really was some real palpable risk there. Now I, right. I had, I hedged that risk by going on leave from Booth for a year to give myself a chance to try. So I, I always had that safety net. I could go back to Booth. Right. I felt the risk for sure moving out to Seattle with Aaron and like starting a new life without some firm conception of what um, that would look like in the future. Yeah. yeah. For me, I feel like those are the chances you have to take, you know, in order to like really start to flesh out what your life can actually look like. And right. if you don't, you know, then you miss out on opportunities. So um, so I mean, no, it's our life, you know, these are our lives, not, exactly. not yeah. our advisor's lives or, you know, I mean, it's, this is the one life we get to do something really, uh, that is meaningful and that's all subjective. I, Heck that's, 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 that's economics there. It's all subjective preferences. Exactly. Yeah. So I, so what my, the next step was I moved to, I, I started working at Amazon um, and worked there. I worked at Amazon for four years and then, um, you know, became sort of moved from just being like an individual, independent individual contrib contributor to like managing a team, et cetera, mm. and, like a, a transition. Um, and then I moved to Uber, um, which we could talk about if you'd like. Um, yeah. And, and, Boy, so how long were you at Amazon? Four years. Four years. And, and so that would have been what, like 2019 or something? 2015, I think 2015 to 2019 was. The, yeah, right. And so you've been at Uber since then? So you've had one, you had one move, you went from Amazon to Uber? Correct, yeah. What were you hired at Uber to do? Like, uh, what was your title originally? I was a director of applied science, so. A director of applied science. I don't even know how any of this works. Yeah, this I know, means. right, yeah. Like, I like, only know so, academic units. So, like, what what is it exactly? It's a totally opaque system of, uh, just like the academic one is opaque to everybody except for people in the academic world. Yeah. There's a whole tech opaque culture around different levels and different job titles and things along those lines. So you specifically asked me about like my job title, I guess, or what my right. job, it, it's, I gave you my title, but yeah, that's pretty meaningless. Okay. Anyways, yeah, what I was hired to do was work um, on the science components of the earner side of the Uber marketplace. So everything having to do with drivers and to oh. couriers, right? Like, which has all kinds of like super interesting economic problems embedded in it, right? Because you think about like labor supply problems and questions yeah. combined with, you know, what we were talking about a little bit earlier, at least this is marketplace design, right? Things along those lines. Yeah. So I started out doing that and my career progressed at Uber to the point where now I'm leading a much bigger chunk of the Uber science infrastructure, right? Yeah. So what really attracted me to Uber um, not that you asked this question, but I'll answer it anyway, is mm -hmm. um, two things. One is I love this idea of working on on and for earners, right? I think mm. the earner component of the Uber platform is really powerful and is really an enabler in a, in a deep way, right? Mm. You can download the Uber app, pass a background check and earn money, right? And to me, that was very, very powerful and a, and a very motivating force was to mm. work in that area to try and understand 
um, you know, how things worked and, and what was working well and what wasn't working well. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing that was really exciting to me intellectually was just this marketplace design question, about, right? Yeah. No other company in the world, very, I won't say none, very few other companies in the world that are so dependent and so have such an interesting marketplace. Yeah. Um, so between the two of those things, uh, you know, I don't, there aren't too many companies that are better to work at for, if you're interested in the sorts of things that I'm interested in. Then, then well, really. So what's your day job like? What do you, what do you, what are you doing when you wake up and all throughout the day? I sit in a lot of meetings, Scott. I sit in a lot of meetings. Yeah. You know? So, um, you know, as you, you know, what you realize is um, as your team becomes bigger, you end up just filling your time with meetings. Um, and so I have to consciously work to clear calendar time to, you know, um, to not be in meetings and read docs, things along those lines. So the way I think about it now is most of my day job is really around, you know, vetting the work that my team is doing and communicating that out to, you know, senior leaders at Uber, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, in some ways, I kind of think of myself more like, you know, when you're a junior professor, assistant professor, you're doing all the work yourself, right? When you're a senior professor, you kind of are advising grad students a lot more. And on the projects that you're working on, you probably have research assistants that are grad students, things along those lines. And mm-hmm. so my day job is much more in that latter camp right now. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, helping my team, reviewing their work, um, moving them in different directions, things along those lines. So, I mean, so, that doesn't seem like, I guess, it, do, do you think that you, there's a counterpart to you in academia that's like, like, you know, the, the lab, the guy that runs the lab, or is there like some counterpart to this that would make sense to academics? Oh, I think like, if you look, you know, so, so set aside economics for a second, but like, think about the academic world more generally, and like, sort of these models of science, right? Like, yeah. you know, chemistry, where you have a, a your, your chemistry lab, and you know, like, you know, you have your grad students, you have your postdocs, and then you have the leader of the lab, right, in essence. Um, I think that is actually not so different from what it's like to do science in a tech company, right? Mm. Now, there are lots of other similarities and dif- differences, but at the end of the day, I'll bet if you asked one of those folks, like, what's your day job? It would probably sound a lot like mine, which is you meet with a lot of people, you review a lot of research, you write stuff up, you do presentations, right? Yeah. You know, on those lines. And you're presenting stuff that isn't always things that you worked on directly, but you worked on indirectly through, you know, the people that are working. You, you know, something you just said, actually, doing science in tech, I definitely don't think that some body i think there's a lot of people out there they would not have known that that is what the economist is being hired to do science in the tech yeah totally i think it's a misconception that a lot of people have in the academic world at least i don't know how this extends outside of the academic world yeah that like you know we're like slaves to the machine in the tech you know like i think we're doing very real science um and in many ways, I think we're actually doing probably more sophisticated and better science in the academic world mm-hmm. because we have access to more data. Yeah, you know, right, right. More data. And, more inst- and more correct institutional details, it seems exactly, like. Exactly, exactly. Institutional details, data, and the ability to run experiments yeah. means I think we do some pretty sophisticated and good science. And you know, though, Chris, great. like, here's, the thing is, though, like, I was, I was, I'm teaching this history of economic thought class, and, and it's like, it's really kind of interesting because... Uh, of how Malthus or Smith or, you know, it would be like Smith and then it would be Malthus and Ricardo, you know, they can only interact with each other because they published. Right. And and it seems like the thing is in tech is like you guys are generating all of this knowledge, but it's all like, is it going to get, is it going to get carried forward? You know, like, or does it all just get, siloed and doesn't become general knowledge yeah there's a lot of knowledge sharing that goes on indirectly within the tech industry and Mm -hmm. a lot i think this is a well-worn like subject in terms of silicon valley but a lot of that flows through people moving from one firm to another right yeah right and and we do have our own conferences where we talk about this sort of stuff so I, i think there's a lot of knowledge within tech you know, around how to do things and how to think about economics within the tech world. I mm-hmm. think um, I think you're raising a really good point, though. Does that ever get exported out of the tech world? Mm-hmm. And that bridge just hasn't been built right now, um, which is unfortunate. And I, I think it's, you know, just to be really fair, 
I think it's on both sides, right? Like I think mm. tech people who work in tech have obviously been reluctant to publish on a lot of things for two reasons. One is, you know, just like competitive knowledge. And then the yeah. second is time, right? Like, I was just about to say, you know, like, when am I supposed to write a paper? When right? are you going like, to write it? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's not in the incentives either. Right. Of right. the firm necessarily. Right. Like what do they gain from it? Yeah. But I will say this, you know, a, a place like Uber more so than Amazon is very willing to go down the path of considering publishing. And, and actually a bunch of research has come out of Uber you know, with my yeah. friend Jonathan Hall and his group has written a bunch of papers. So it's not like it's, this is not an insurmountable battle. Like it's possible that we would publish this sort of stuff. So this is why I say it's also on the other side, which is what is the, what would be the reception of something like that? Because the thing I really wouldn't want to do is spend a lot of time on a paper and then just have it be shat on when they're yeah. talking about it, right? Right. You know, so it's kind of like that delicate balance of saying like, yes, I would love to write really good papers that kind of share knowledge. Um, but what I don't really want to do is go down the path of spending a bunch of time and energy writing a paper that then ends up being like not really that interesting to the academic yeah. world. So, but it's, it's funny though, because like, you know, the, it's like part of the scientific production function, it seems like is, is publishing yeah. because it's, it, as opposed to just like, like, I don't always think when you're a kid, you're taking science classes and stuff and you like, you, you just, it's very, I, it's like individual, you know, but like the publishing part is what allows it to become a social thing and it it's funny i mean it's i mean it has happened you know like uh at guinness you know gossett published anonymously yeah. you know so like there there's definitely i know that that there is uh you know but that's the whole thing right it's like that was a crucial discovery yeah. but it only it was but it was from publishing and i guess i just wonder like i mean i guess it's like I, I kind of do have a lot of confidence that stuff does tend to get out that is important, you know, and that humans sort of solve these things collectively. I just always wonder to myself, like, are you guys over there proving something that's like really socially critical that doesn't get out? Yeah. Um, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, I would say the challenge is that most of the time, the answer is probably no. Uh -huh. right? There may be that five or 10% of things that we're doing that should get out and would be really interesting to get out, right? But as you know very well, it's very challenging to figure out what that five or 10% actually is. Well, you think is. about your econometrica though. Yeah, I, like, I mean, that's yeah. like uh, the amount of, I mean, I guess I might be teaching it wrong, but like, I always think how much money is being wasted hypothetically when the return on investment on search engine marketing from you know correlational analysis is between 1600 and 4000 yeah. percent and then you run an, a randomized control trial and it's between negative three and you know negative 150 percent it yeah. seems like that's a tremendously important discovery about what might be a potentially wasteful use of humans scarce resources. Yeah. But like well, eBay here, could have easily said, eBay could have easily said, nah, yeah. we're not doing it. You know, here's the thing, Scott, and and uh and Steve will probably not love me like going down this path, but like I'm not actually sure how much impact that paper has in practice. I think it's been tremendously successful within the academic world and academics love to talk about it from the perspective of like, hey, you know, look at this that shows that industry is quoted for like doing something stupid. But the reality is, if you look at how most firms are actually making paid search decisions, they're still doing the same thing that eBay was. In fact, it's a constant discussion that I have with people in terms of like, hey, how do you actually do this better? And so I do, I would challenge, I mean, like, I, I'm glad that paper got published. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised at um, the reception that that got, to be really honest. And, you know, obviously it was a very strong, positive reception. I didn't expect it to be that um, um, strong, positive. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that we've seen the feedback loop actually come back and change the industry in any re really meaningful ways. I yeah, think. sure. But that's the thing is like a lot of that stuff seems long run though, you know, yeah. like Jon Snow uh, died and nobody believed any of the crap he, 
he has got these beautiful pictures and this incredibly well-crafted argument. It's like, you know, the rhetoric of his book in sure. um, is incredible. And he does. Yeah. And they only, uh, they only, you know, gr believe him uh, 15 years later when they have another cholera outbreak. And it's in an area where they hadn't moved the pipes yet. And it's like, you know, and Emily Dickinson, her poems were never published in her lifetime. And it's like, it just seems like, you know, some of this stuff is a, is just a part of the, starts to become the fabric of knowledge, you know? And it's like, I just can't imagine that, you know, some, some kid in who's learning about advertising for the first time, you know, reads your paper and it just doesn't have an effect. Yeah. In the long run. I, I like how you put that though. I, I think it, it, it kind of points to a much broader need here, which I like what you said about like a fabric of knowledge, right? To a certain extent, you know? And I think maybe it's more about, and I'm glad we're I'm kind of thinking this out loud on the spot. It's more less about any individual paper and it's mm -hmm. more about it's the general exporting of the fabric of knowledge that yeah. I think we now. Like, and so, you know, I, I'll give you one very specific example, which is, I think we know a lot more about demand curves within firms than we do outside of firms at this point, right? You know, mm. you know, and like you think about like the traditional way of like estimating demand firms or demand curves, like you know, with like you know BLP, if that means anything to, yeah. to you know, your listeners. Um, and you know, like we've just come a long way with, and especially within tech, where it's critical to understand what demand curves look like, right? So that's an area where is that like a really good paper? I don't know, right. but there's certainly a fabric of knowledge there. Yeah. About, what we could do and what we've learned from demand systems mm -hmm. that's that's not in the academic world that you know I think probably should be there. Um, but again, it's really hard to figure out how do you package that together and have the conversation in a way that moves knowledge forward. And I, the thing I would say about that is, you know very well, Scott, like it's not like the publishing process is some like super clean. Yeah, amazing, totally. It's a kind of a shit show, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's filled like, with lots of lots of stuff. Um, yeah. So you you kind of like you work backward from the idea that the whole process is dirty, in my opinion. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Has all this complexity and all these traps associated with it. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, well, how do we actually bridge those things? Yeah. Um, I think you know, if there were a desire on both sides to make this happen, I think it it could, and it would be mm -hmm. fascinating because right. This, the sorts of stuff that I think we learn are just intellectually really, really interesting, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I have other questions, but I feel like I've talked, I, I just want to, I guess I am debating about this just could take a long time, but like, I just, I guess I'm just gonna ask real quick. So, right. you know, you, we, we have similar interests. I was surprised uh, that, um, that we've been, in, I've been interested in similar things. You, so I, I have this, background though it's very on the surface it's really different so like i have this uh interest in the uh illicit markets yeah and um and particularly internet mediated sex work now that's what my whole career's been about until just really recently and um and so i found a website that uh where clients would review sex workers uh back in 07 and i had never heard anything like that and so, you know, I just spent a long time on it and, but, you know, my ability to study it was really limited to being able to scrape the website, you know? And so there was like, it's, it's really scraping is so kind of like such a double-edged sword because you're like, oh my gosh, I have all this. And then you're like, you can't seem to like do more. You can't, right. especially with the website, like the erotic review, like they won't answer your emails. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so like, you know, you're, I can't even get questions answered. So, um, but you've written about it and it's like, so this, this thing I was wanting to talk about is like the erotic review has reviews, clients review sex workers. The Silk Road was uh, a platform on tour and you could, it was really innovative, you could buy drugs and uh, there was sellers. They had an escrow account, early adopter of Bitcoin and um, they used reviews too, sure. but so like superficially, I think a, a lot of people are like, oh, the, the reviews are enforcing contracts that are otherwise not enforceable because these are illegal markets and you can't like sue somebody for selling you drugs that is not real or whatever. But you've kind of written at a deeper level about reputation 
And because you've got this paper, this 2015 working paper with with Steve to Dallas. And I just was kind of curious, like, what about what? It, first of all, what role big picture yeah. is reputation playing in economic activity from your your from you being a professional economist that studies for a long time? And uh, why is it that online reviews are 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 not functioning well as reputation mechanisms in general. Yeah. Um I think it I think you have to decompose the problem into two different pieces when you think about most of this, right? One is do reputation systems work well enough to you know make a market work that wouldn't work otherwise? Mm. And the answer is probably yes, right? I think the reputation systems have enough bite to them that there are whole markets that might not exist were it not for reputation systems. I think eBay is the classic example of that. In fact, eBay is often used as an example of a market that couldn't exist without reviews. Why? Why am I not needing reputations when I go buy milk at the grocery store? I don't know anything I, about it. I don't know anything about these farmers. Oh, I think it's two things. It's brand and it's the fact that the supermarket is vetting for you and they have their They're own. doing it already. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's all baked in. Reputation is kind of baked, baked in. Baked into the firm that you go to, right? Like you wouldn't you know, if you went to if you went to a supermarket and they sold you rotten milk, you wouldn't go back to that supermarket. You wouldn't go back to it. So there. Yeah. So okay, got it. So it actually is happening all yeah. the time. Totally I don't awesome. know it's happening because of why? why, 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 why. So why is it that it's like more visible than in eBay and all these other places? Because the sellers are anonymous. So oh, okay, the sellers are anonymous in that case. You need a a, a dynamic system of something like reviews to flesh out that, you know, what a brand does for a supermarket or what your experience with that particular supermarket does, right? Yeah. And set differently, like you're gonna repeat, go back to that same supermarket over and over again. So you're gonna learn about the quote unquote reputation without like a review. You probably never looked at a review of your local Safeway because you don't need to, because you went to the Safeway, yeah. you learned your stuff, right? But in a market like eBay, you're interacting or Amazon or any of these other or Uber, right? You're interacting with a bunch of anonymous actors and you might never interact with that person again. Right? Yeah. But you need the dynamic linkage of something like a review system to jumpstart something like an eBay system relative to like our traditional economic activity yeah. where you're dealing with known players. So right. I, I, I do think like going back to like this decomposition into two parts, the first part is kind of saying like, hey, eBay probably couldn't have existed without a review system, right? right. I, I don't think it probably wouldn't. And that, I think that's true. And I think when people have stated it, I don't know, like there's no empirical evidence one way or the other, um, but you know, it's probably, it's pretty good intuition that that's true. Mm -hmm. But then I think the second thing, which is where my paper, the paper with Steve kind of floats in this area is they probably work less well than you think they do, you know? Okay. And it's sort of discipline bad actors, I think pretty quickly. Mm. Um, and, you know, are able to like weed out like some of the really bad stuff pretty quickly, yeah. you know? Um, but when it comes to distinguishing between say the 25th percentile and the 99th percentile of things, mm. I don't think reputation or review systems actually help you as much as, as, you know, people might think that they would. Right. And so sort of that gets into this question of like what the paper is getting at, which is you have to think carefully about the incentives that you set up within the reputation mechanism to yeah. try and create as much quote unquote good data as possible. And frankly, I just don't think most firms have done that well. And I think a good example of this is go to Amazon and like look at all their third party sellers and you're like spend an hour sorting through things. Is it cheap Chinese? I mean, cheap, like, you know, imported stuff that isn't blah, 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 right? It's pretty much a pretty big, hard process to go through a lot of that sort of stuff. So, mm. so no, I think it's like, the promise of helping markets work works pretty well. And that's probably true in the case of your sex workers example as well. I would I would posit a guess, right? Uh -huh. you know, like probably pretty hard to um, distinguish between the 25th percentile and the 99th percentile, but you're yeah. probably gonna probably gonna get rid of the zero to 25th percentile, you know. And I make well, it it's like you get all these weird things that people don't really I mean, you know, I think you get a lot with voluntary reviews, you get a lot of things that are not obviously revealing a lot of information like you get a lot of people that write a lot of reviews you know like like most of the reviews will come from a small number of people but you're not really sure if that means most of the economic activity right is coming from those people because there's all this like selection 
these all these weird selection things and so you're not really pause you know it's like when you're observing it you're just not really sure what you're observing you know yeah. always yeah. anyway i think if you start to think about your what you do as a consumer you actually if you're if you're engaging on any of these websites that that um you know have a lot of uh sort of uh, reliance on reviews, you're spending a tremendous amount of mental energy to undo the sort of stuff that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Not exactly the like, but like the, you know, you kind of understand that there's a certain bias. Some of these reviews may be fake, right? right. You know, like, oh, does this, this seller only has one review versus 10 reviews? What do I, how do I balance those? And so you end up with a pretty rich set of heuristics around decisions. Yeah. Um, and sometimes then you still get stuff you don't want, you know? Right, and so, right. Um, so I think if you really if you really think about it, it's a failure of online review systems that the heuristics have to be so complicated to process through the information that ends mm -hmm. up you know, being created by these reputation mechanisms. So that's is I guess this a pretty active area within tech, like the just studying reviews and re review mechanisms and things like that? Less so than you would think. Not really. Um, you know, so most firms, and I can say this like you know with my experience at a few different firms usually kind of have this mentality of like set it up, set it up and forget about it. Right. Set it up and get it right. Maybe because maybe at the margin, maybe the gains aren't huge at the margin to get it right. Exactly. And, you know, as long as people are willing to do that heuristic work that I was talking about, mm -hmm. then by most of the metrics from a tech perspective, what's the value of improving these things, right? Yeah. How people are doing the work, right? So um, I do think I, I haven't seen a ton of like really active work within tech on this. Mm -hmm. I think there should be, frankly, um, and, you know, I, I hope that we end up evolving and making better systems um, yeah. because I don't, I don't love the like sort of steady state that we're in right now. Yeah. Well, so, okay. I'm going to end with this. So I was just kind of curious, you know, um, the thing is like, you know, there's, you don't know what you don't know. That's kind of like always, it's like, so you don't know what you don't know. And there's all these people uh, that don't know what it's like being a tech economist. They don't yeah. even know the categories to even ask questions like what it's like. So yeah. I was curious, like just in your own short, brief kind of conclusion of this, like, what do you think is the, what, what, do you, what has been for you the salient information that you think this really is something that is competitive that's not obvious to, you know, it's not obvious to other people. It's competitive and whatever it is that you love about being an economist, it's actually there. Yeah. Great question. Um, I think the simple answer from my perspective is you are rewarded in tech for being intellectually curious and coming up with ideas that the firm has not thought about before. Mm. In other words, you are rewarded in tech for doing a lot of the same things that you are rewarded for in the academic world. Mm. It's just the process by which you get there is very different because you collaborate, you work with people in a very different way from the academic world. Mm. And so the number one, like if I could dispel a myth about working in tech, it's this idea that, hey, you move to tech and now all of a sudden the firm, whatever that may be, is telling you what problems to work on, right? That is not true to a certain extent, right? Like you're, you are rewarded for coming up with new ideas, not for mm -hmm. working on things that people already have been working on in the past, right? They don't need PhD economists to come in and do something that a product manager could do, right? They right. need PhD economists to come in and say like, hey, we're thinking about this problem in the wrong way. You should think about your marketplace design or your review system totally different than you are right now. Yeah. So um, I think people don't understand that. And I've had this conversation so many times with econ PhDs where they're like, well, I don't want to lose my um, flexibility in what I work on and things along those lines. And, and I think that's just the wrong approach because ultimately I'm much happier, um, you know, being able to contribute to changing the way, you know, we think about problems at Uber and that's what I'm rewarded for, right? Yeah. So it lines, up, it, lines up, it lines up much more closely um, than people actually think. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's a, it, it's just a common myth out there that like, you know, people are telling us what to do. We don't have any choice or agency. Right. Right. Awesome. Well, it seems like the watching uh, the things that you've gotten to work on just kind of, you know, just from even reading your working papers and your publications, it's, it's been really cool. Well, I really appreciate getting to talk. It's been really fun. Um, it's really nice to, to meet you finally and uh, get a chance to talk to you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Appreciate you having me on.